I am uh, going to talk about using Rust to manage fatal process crashes and provide post-mortem analysis. That's a super uh, snappy title and it, it, this talk does have a Halloween theme, so apologies if um, if this orange and black is, is kind of upsetting you, but it's uh, it's just the time of the year. I'm also quite happy I found this turnip head here um, on the interwebs. Sort of prefer turnips, um, Halloween gear over pumpkin ones. Um, these are sort of traditional Irish pumpkin heads that have been found. Um, and they're super ghoulish. Pumpkin. They're like proper scary as opposed to the sort of cartoony pumpkin things. Anyway, really like them. So I'm going to creep on the, creep on up on this a little bit. What I want to talk about is sort of a bit of the motivation around um, what am I talking about when I talk about fatal process crashes? Where does it sit in the whole sort of observability landscape? And then just give a demo of, of what I've been working on for the past couple of years um, uh, in a sort of Kubernetes environment. Okay. So back in 2015, um, there's a guy called Brian Cantrell who did a talk in DockerCon. Um, basically gave one of the better definitions I've seen for the different types of failure. Um, as a software industry, we don't really have good categorization of errors and the types of errors and the best way to analyze those types of errors, but we are slowly getting there um, as, as more and more sort of conversations happen around observability. Okay, but I, I like the way that uh, Brian in his presentation sort of split up the, the different types of areas that you have, okay? So up the top here, you've got sort of implicit failures. So you get implicit non-fatal, you get implicit fatal errors, and you get explicit non-fatal and explicit fatal areas, okay? So for implicit non-fatal, we get things like wrong responses, um, incorrect results, you get leaking of resources, the, uh, the application that you're running stops doing work or even start making too many calls or calling the wrong things. Like you get these sort of implicit non-fatal failures and you also get um, explicit non-fatal fa uh, failures where error messages uh, are returned and you get error code returned, okay? And that's, and I'll sort of talk about that a little more, but what we're really talking about is when you get implicit or explicit fatal failures, okay? And as an industry, we, and I think my, this is definitely something, just my opinion, but I think because of the nature of the web and the expectation for end users within the browser, we always keep trying to run with best effort, okay? And, where, and that paradigm, well, that works really well in a web browser um, in, in terms of let's just render something. When we build server application and distributed applications, like running in a half known state or a corrupt state isn't something that you want to do. And we should, I think, we should fail out of that. We should crash the process, should take a snapshot of that process to debug it and restart the process. And um, now we've got sort of container technology and everything, it's a lot easier to architect that way than it is to try and continue in some sort of unknown state, okay? So, and when we look at, I'm going to dive into the next slide now. So when, when you look at sort of what's going on in the CNCF landscape, you see that there's a lot of focus on trying to keep everything up and running and understanding what's going on in, in sort of vague areas. But there's nothing in the CNCF landscape for handling fatal crashes or uh, debugging, uh, debugging core dumps or anything like that. Okay. And like I say, I think, I think that's because it's, it's an immaturity as a, uh, as, as, a, as a profession that we still try and keep things running half arsed rather than actually admitting things are wrong and starting all over again, okay? That said, there's, um, uh, there's a reason why you do want to use fatal, uh, fatal observability, okay? So when, you, it, when you're running things in production, you cannot necessarily access the production environment in order to do what I consider to be in-situ debugging, okay? So you can all the time log into production, attach a debugger, set a breakpoint, and start stepping, stepping through, okay? Because fundamentally you get access issues in, in restricted environments, financial services, regulated environments. You just can't, those, you're not allowed to go in and, and kind of do that. Similarly, in, in those regulated environments, you can't deploy the debugging tools into there because there's only a subset of tools that you can put into those environments. In-situ debugging also creates highs and bugs. So if you actually attach a debugger to a process that's, that's 
acting strangely you you cause it to operate differently and all of a sudden the bug disappears or you can't reproduce it um, and most of the time or a lot of the time you also have unoptimized builds as well okay so in situ debugging in a production environment isn't isn't necessarily a good uh, isn't necessarily a good solution okay and we've mitigated against that by logging okay so we've introduced and if we go back to look at all the cncf projects they're all around sort of improving logging aggregating logging uh, coalescing uh, transactions across multiple services etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and we've really focused on logging the, the problems with logging and they are they only capture by default they only capture the known knowns so you kind of have to log where the problem is going to be and if you if it's if it's somewhere that you that you didn't log then you can't see what the problem is okay so you have to mitigate against that or you have to you have to not mitigate against it you have to improve that by putting logs in you get an error you don't know what's happening you can't see it in the logs you put in more logging then you do another build and you deploy that build that again is risky um and uh, and time consuming and error prone because invariably you have to go through CICD, etc cetera, etc cetera, in order to get that pushed into a production environment and hopefully you can you can reproduce it and we've also started logging stack traces so when a when people have actually admitted that their application is failing and they what they do is they bomb their stack trace to the console uh, and then exit the process but that doesn't necessarily capture all the state of the process at the time it just captures the stack and what was what variables were being passed through the stack it doesn't necessarily capture what was going on within within specific function within the stack and what the parameters were, the configuration of that process, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so logging is getting there, but it doesn't it doesn't solve completely for this um, fatal observability scenario. Okay, and again, I put links to all this. So there's a, this is a brilliant article, uh, not article, it's a, it's a it's a paper for ACM 2011 by Dave Pacheco, where he gives a brilliant breakdown into all these sort of problems with. Uh, with debugging in production environments and it's definitely worth a read if if you're if you're interested in actually getting things to work in production so in terms of an analyzing uh, fatal crashes in production environments there are there is some prior art there's from giant who are now part of samsung there's uh, something called thoth this is an incredible piece of technology um, it's based on illumos um, which is a, a Solaris derivative or the open source version of Solaris. Um, and it requires a hell of a lot of infrastructure uh, in order to run it. But it does provide things like advanced search, grouping and ticketing of the different errors that you uh, different fatal exceptions that you get. And um, it also provides on demand debugging. It's just a beast to actually install. So a lot of what I've been building has been looking at that and going, yeah, I, I like that feature. I'd like to, I'd like to have something like that within a sort of container environment, but it isn't as heavy a lift in terms of architecture as as Starf is. Okay, and then Fujitsu also came out with a something that I actually contributed to for a while. It was a C Bash source um, project that literally just took core dumps from Kubernetes and put them on the file system. In a, in a relatively simple fashion. It didn't do anything with them after, it didn't allow you to debug them, it had no sort of rich features around it, but it did show you the configuration that you need to do in a Kubernetes environment in order to, uh, in order to collect a core dump, okay? So I, I looked at all those things with those, with the, um, what we, with sort of that wider picture of we need to have a, a application infrastructure that will allow us to have fatal errors and understand what happens in fatal errors. And looking at some of the prior art, the, what I put in for this core dump handler, handler, as I call it, as design, key design goals is, I wanted to be simple to install. So I looked at Tharth and went, that's literally months, if not week, weeks, if not months to install. I wanted it to be one liner install for this in a Kubernetes environment. And I also wanted the debugging sessions to be as smooth as possible. So one of the challenges when you're doing post-mortem analysis is you have to get the XE um, that you've, that's crashed. You have to get the core dump that's crashed. You have to put them together. You have to get the source code. You have to install the debugging tools, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just for developers, that's quite labor intensive. So I wanted to sort of smooth that flow out. Um, Provide a CLI with, with pre-installed tools kind of speaks to that as well in terms of making it easy. I wanted to use keep it using established technologies 
And so I didn't want to bring in anything too exotic in into the solution because I, when I've been deploying sort of solutions into into third parties and with and with customers during my day job, like the more things like databases and uh, message queues, et cetera, et cetera, that you, that you bring into the solution, the more time it takes to adopt. So I just wanted to use S3 and an S3 API, doesn't matter where, where it was hosted, but S3 compatible API, the Kubernetes client, zip and LLDB uh, as the debugger. And that, that pretty much the, uh, the, the extent of the technology that it, that's involved in sort of running this and debugging your uh, applications as well. I mentioned that targeting Kubernetes particularly, uh, that's where I spend most of my time at the moment, but I also want it to be useful or usable on uh, native OS as well. So you can run this technology in an OS, so you can use it to collect core dumps that not, not necessarily happen in Kubernetes, happening in sort of more legacy environments and provide good, configura good configuration documentation and that type of thing. So when I've spent a lot of time deploying open source in, in customers, in third parties, and one of the challenges is sort of from an, oper from an ops point of view, from a security point of view, how do you audit this? What code's involved, et cetera, et cetera. Like what's it touch, what, what doesn't it touch? So I wanted to be as clear as I possibly could on, on, what, it, on what those components are and, and sort of what it's doing. Okay, so apologies for this, it's very white um, and it's quite an involved sort of breakdown of, of the sort of different aspects of Kubernetes, but I just wanted to give a flavor of sort of the types of diagrams and level of detail that we're putting into this. Okay, so fundamentally from a server components, it's a Helm chart on the left hand side that pushes uh, artifacts to the Kubernetes API. Okay, and what it actually deploys is a daemon set, which is, a, think of that as an application. And um, it creates a privileged policy because it's going to manipulate the actual compute node in the Kubernetes infrastructure. So it, it is a privileged process. It creates a service account. It creates some volumes to, uh, to save the cores onto and to, um, uh, and to pass configuration between the uh, service, between the agent and the underlying service as well. And then it deploys an agent, which is basically responsible for taking the core dumps and putting them into a cloud object storage. And then the agent also deploys a, uh, an XE onto the host machine that handles the core dumps. So when, when a process crashes, that process is, uh, that crashing process is passed to the operating system to, a, to uh, the core dump composer, which basically puts that into a zip um, creates a load of JSON files by querying the Kubernetes infrastructure to ensure you've got as much information as possible, and then put and then puts it into the file system, and then the agent picks that up and puts it into the cloud object store. Okay, and then so that's the service layout. So that's what's looking after when your process crashes in a Kubernetes cluster. That's looking after creating as much information about it as possible, and then the um, then there's a CLI that you use to debug. And the CLI basically wraps around the kubectl client, creates a debug pod, gets the, the original image from the process that's crashed, gets the core dump, merges them together in a single pod, lays them out onto a shared local disk, and then you can debug that in a remote environment as well. So you don't have to install those tools locally. Okay, so before I jump into a demo, is anybody any questions about that? Does that make any sense at all? I have a question, Anton, but I suppose yep. it's not quite on the core team. But at the start, you were talking about, um, and this isn't an opinion, I'm just wondering about yours, about bailing out early and, you know, the kind of the graceful degradation or eventual consistency. I suppose they're both versions of not doing that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so, well, eventual consistency if to me is more around uh, data synchronization okay so it's a that's a methodology around how you are going to uh, how you're going to deal with your data is do you need your data to be present right there and then or not available or can you deal with it being being sorted out later okay or pass it later okay so that's more of a data architecture or a paradigm whereas what i'm talking about here is and i've seen it in i've seen it in node i've seen it in java I've seen it in like .NET as well. It's just 
um, people passing or uh, swallowing exceptions um, and trying to make forward progress on the server side um, uh, without accepting that it, an error has occurred, failing, asserting that errors, that, er that errors happened, and then restarting the process based on that. So I, yeah. I see. So to answer your question now, I see them as two slightly different things. No, no, no. It makes perfect sense. Thanks, Antonia. Yeah, I've often chased down those swallowed exceptions for hours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell me about it. Yeah, you can, you can tell I'm, I'm I'm speaking from experience here. And I've done it to myself as well. You know, it, oh, it's grand. I'll just I'll fix it next time. And it's like, oh, it works. Oh, yeah, yeah. So um, right. Yeah. What I want to do is so. I've actually built a, or put together a little sample application here uh, to show this off. So let's go here. Okay, so this is under my GitHub repo example crashing app. Okay, and it's basically a tutorial of what I'm going to, what I'm going to step you through. But if we just look at the source code here, it's very simple. Um, yeah, so I built a, a, a little sample Rust app that, that errors. Okay, and it's basically got a set of nested calls, do test calls, foo calls, bar, bar panics. Okay, explicitly panics. So what I'm sure, the, the core dump would happen if, if I did a segment, if I did a memory allocation error at rare bounds, et cetera, et cetera, you get still get the same functionality. But I thought what was interesting about this is you can explicitly call uh, panic within your code and you will get a core dump and you will be able to do that analysis afterwards, right? So in terms of what I did, the additional pieces that you require is in your prof release profile, you want to include, include the symbols, okay? So this is the equivalent of passing dash G into, your, in, into the command uh, compiler, okay? And then you want to, on panic, you want to abort. So this sends the abort signal, which uh, notifies the operating system, which then takes the core dump and you're, you're away in a hat, okay? So that's... What's going on with this Rust program? Then in Kubernetes, then so when I run that in Kubernetes, uh, very very simply just just run it and it automatically crashes. It comes up here and uh, generates a pod error. Okay, pod deployment error. The um, if I go into this namespace. So I've deployed my core dump handler into the observed namespace, which it does by default. So that's uh, the core dump handler has uploaded that uh, the error the core dump from the error pod into uh, an object storage here. Okay, so this is on IBM Cloud. I've got an S3 compatible object storage. You can see I've done a couple of tests. This one's what I'm showing you here is from sort of earlier on today because I just want, wanted to sort of step through it quite handily. So it's, it's generated this zip file that contains the core file and all the Kubernetes sort of configuration that went along with that pod, okay? So when I download that here, just to show you what's in that zip file, I've got a number of, uh, I've got the, the dump info, so that has the, the dump file, the timestamp it happened, the host name, the exe, the PID, the signal that was sent, um, I've got the image information, so I know which image it relates to the one that's crashed. Um, I've got uh, some specific input, uh, input from the Kubernetes cluster about what the pod, what configuration the actual pod had. So I can, I can see what's going on. Uh, I can see what's going on there. I can see what annotations were added, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and similarly for um, the process info, so I can query uh, the environment to uh, to get additional info related to the process, which gives me which maps the image basically to the process that was running, and then provides additional labels um, that were set up on the on the process. And then finally, I have actually a little bit of that. Yeah, I've got I've got some additional runtime info as well. Okay, so it gives me some of the internals like the namespaces, the uh, the network it was sitting on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so I've got more than just so there's a lot of this that's just extraneous and you probably never need it, but there's other, also you don't know what you're going to need. So you, you can get quite a lot of that information from, from Kubernetes when the, process, when the process is dying. So you can sort of piece all that together. Okay. So that's 
I've ran a process, that process has crashed. Kubernetes has picked that up, generated a core dump, generated a load of, uh, a load of JSON for me. But as a developer, sort of what, what do I do next? You know, and that's, that's always the, 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 the challenge. Like you've got too much information, it's information overload, right? So what I'm just gonna do now is just step into like a little debug program. Um, so I've got my core dump up there and I've got this core dump uh, CLI which is in the project page for Core Dump Handler. You can download this as a client, uh, pre-built client. And I'm just going to point it to that zip, um, give it the name of the, uh, the image and the name of the executable uh, that I'm running, okay? So again, because I want to keep this as simple as possible, I, I could have built an API that this, this client queried and sort of generated all this sort of automatically for me. I'm, that's that's more of a server side service and I'll talk about sort of future work, but right now you just feed it, you feed it the zip, the name of the image and the name of the app and you run it, okay? So what's happening here is this is starting a container up on the Kubernetes environment and it's dropped me into a container with, uh, with the core installed, with some debug tools installed. And this is all sort of remotely. So I don't have to pull all this down onto my machine um, and get all this sort of set up locally. So it's kind of handy enough that way, okay? So in here, I've got the, the same thing we just stepped through on my local machine, which is the zip file. You can, uh, you can inspect, uh, you can inspect this. So you can still see the same JSON that I've downloaded and showed in Visual Studio Code there. You can, you have full access to that. And I've also got a command line utility that I've provided with this, which is run debug. Actually, the other thing that it does is it sets up some environment variables as well. So it gives me, um, it gives me the XE location and some other configuration pieces. So I know where, uh, I know I can easily map the XE and the core dump together within the run debug, okay? So if when I run run debug now, it drops me straight into LLDB and I'll control plus, no, no, it's too late for that switch. No, there we go. Um, so I can just do a backtrace here. Okay, and that dumps literally the backtrace that I had, which is okay, that's cool. And I can, uh, I can look back here and say, okay, I can see bar, um, I can see foo, and then I've got a panic. So the last thing to be called was bar. So I can move to frame uh, eight there. So I can go F8. And that moves me to that frame. And I can see that it was passed in as input. It was passed in hello world, but that's okay. But I know from my, I know from my source code that actually hello world was created further up the stack. So I, if I move to frame 10 and then print uh, the variables, I can actually get a dump of the uh, text variable that I created within, the, uh, within that frame, within that code. So if we just jump back into, uh, where have we gone here? And then that one or that one there. Okay, it's so just so everyone's sort of aware of what we're, where, where we are here. Okay, so if we go in here, I want to be able to get hold of this. Okay, and again, this is the difference between core dumps and just getting the stack trace. With core dumps, you can jump in and actually look at the state of the application when it crashed, as opposed to just seeing what was being passed to what. So I can have a look at what was calculated where, et cetera, et cetera. So if you've got a multi-threaded system or something like that, and things get a bit complex, this, um, this gets a lot easier, uh, or not easier. It gets a lot more possible to do even than, uh, than anything, uh, than trying to read a stack trace or putting debug breaks in to get more logs to try and see if that's it, et cetera. Just get it when it fails, okay? So that's okay, but like I still had to sort of flip-flop between, um, uh, between the source code and sort of the, the debug environment here as well. So I just, again, it's not, it's not, this is more of a feature of LLDB, but I think as we're sort of giving a little demo here, I think it's worthwhile sort of showing this feature of LLDB because some folks might not be aware of kind of how, how this works. So what we have is if I clone, then, uh, so what I've done there is I cloned the source code into this and then I rerun the debugger. Okay. 
and oops, sorry. And then I'm going to put in some a little bit of magic in here to uh, to set this. So I'd like to get a bit more automation around this bit in particular, but I can once you're running LLDB, you can tell it that you've now got the source code locally. So this will match the source code to the um, to the local the the source code you've checked out to where the build was done that created the executable. Okay, so now when I go F10, it actually prints the source code where my error happened. And I can also still look at the variables that were in place there. And I can reason about this a hell of a lot more than I could have previously. Okay, so I think, again, I think the challenge with this tooling is it's not been accessible to developers in any sort of ready fashion for a long time. Um, and I think that's why we don't use postmodern debugging and crash based debugging. It's because it's, it's just not easy. Um, and uh, so hopefully I'm sort of starting to make a bit of progress in making it a bit easier. Now we've got sort of container environments, we've got Kubernetes and we can spin these up. Um, and again, Kubernetes, because it gives you that explicit API where you can go and get the information about the environment that you're running in. It makes building this type of thing really, really relatively simple uh, and using this type of thing relatively simple. Whereas uh, for example, actually if we jump into uh, core. So, because we're running because we're running on Kubernetes now, I can I can support or this product can now support sort of IBM Cloud, Microsoft AKS, AWS, DigitalOcean, Google. Sort of you can you have a simple you have an API that spans all these cloud providers, so you can build tools again. Because if I had to do this with the different AMI, uh, sorry, VSI implementations for all these cloud providers, I just couldn't do it. It'd be a nightmare. Um, so anyway, that's one of the other benefits I've seen for sort of using Kubernetes as an abstraction layer for, for building this type of tooling. Okay. So um, that was the demo. Can't remember if there was anything else. Oh yes, I was just going to talk about a little bit about some future work here. Okay, yeah. So what I'd like to work on next and what I'm going to continue to work on is uh, on-demand dumps. So as well, rather than just waiting for a, a specific fatal error to happen, it'd be useful potentially to do some um, to do some memory analysis using uh, using on-demand core dumps. I know I think Dynatrace do this already. Uh, there are some other tools that, that that kind of do this, and they're good. So you, and they're really good for when you've got memory leaks, and you take a snapshot at one point, snapshot another point. You can roll over those um, those different dumps and look at the different memory profiles that are in there. Um, I'm I'd like to get some core OS support in um, and better EKS support. EKS at the moment is a, it's it, it works. It's fine. It, takes the core dumps, but it doesn't quite get all the metadata that I'd like. So um, like all those different JSON files. So I'm, I'm still sort of looking at that. Um, core OS is the default for OpenShift. Um, and it's a bit of a bit tricky building things for it yet. Um, so that's another thing I want to look at. And then I'm also, now I've got all this data about core dumps. There's a lot of research that's been done over the past uh, couple of years on analyzing stack traces and core dumps and um, correlating the different types. And what, what's, the, what's been found in research is that if you can show sort of multiple similar cases of an error, it's really, really quick to sort of find and debug what you're trying to do. So you can look, sort of look at them, look at what's the same, look at what's different and go, ah, oh, do you know what, it's, it's that. Um, there's core, the core dumps for scrubbing, they contain, uh, core dumps contain potentially sensitive information, credit card information, et cetera, et cetera. So that need, they need to be scrubbed out and it'd be nice to potentially integrate with alerts, et cetera. Um, right now I've got support for JavaScript, Java and Rust and C by default, but I guess no one's writing Kubernetes services in C, but um, if they were, then it does support, it would support that. So I, Go should be fairly straightforward. There's a set of tooling that I just need to get my head around. They've got their own core management, or core analysis stack. Just need to pick that up and put it into a container and that should be okay. Python's a bit trickier. Python doesn't core dump particularly well. 
um, you need a specific debugger for it, but that stuff is slowly improving. And I don't know what's going on with .NET Core. Long time, it's about six years, well, four years since I've looked at .NET Core, so need to work that out. But Microsoft traditionally had good post-mortem tooling, so I'd hope there'll be something in there. Um, I mentioned the source code flaws, the bit that I did there about checking out from GitHub, et cetera, et cetera. I'd like to make that a lot smoother. And then signing the packages, so the Helm charts that you get for deploying this in um, uh, into your Kubernetes environment. There's a lot of movement with the um, uh, with the source pipelines that are that are happening at the moment, and sort of the uh, the attacks that have been injected into packet into open source projects. Just signing stuff is is the way to go. So that's something that I'm going to work on. Okay, so hopefully. That was reasonably interesting. Even if you've got nothing out of it as a Rust developer, at least you've got it's like a 101 of how can I possibly bug, debug? When, when core doubles happen, what's going on and how can it possibly be useful? Um, hopefully, if you've got at least that out of it, and hopefully, if you're using Kubernetes or something like that, there's a bit more interest in it. Um, yeah, so if you do want to try it out, shameless sales plug here. So I'm going to upset her to go. Now he's gone. I should, I'm going to jump into my sales mode and uh, yeah, got a free, if you want a free cluster, you can sign up for one at IBM Cloud and I would personally really appreciate if you've got anything out of this talk, give me a star please or give the project a star on, um, uh, on GitHub. I'm currently up to 21, but um, it is, IBM do give me a bit of time to work on this and the more stars I get, the more time I get to work on it. So I'd appreciate that. Okay. And with that, I will stop sharing. Hi, right, Anton. That was uh, fascinating. God, I didn't realize how much work you put into that over the years. You know, like I've been stuck in places where you're trying to debug something happened in production and you waste so much time trying to replicate it. And you can never actually replicate it. You don't have your input data, et cetera. I have a stack of questions here for you, but I just want to open it up to um, the audience here before I start rabbiting on with my ill-informed questions. Does anybody have any questions for Anton there? Cool. Thanks for reminding us with the science and time. So <laughs> here's come some stupid questions that probably other people were afraid to ask. Yeah. Um, when you pass in the minus G, the you know your executable size bloats, and I can imagine something like npm or something like that. You know, like are you talking about a colossal size of the file that you're trying to deploy? Does this affect your Docker image size, etc.? Like, does does the minus G flag have to be in production and all the metadata it brings with it? Yeah. So you need the symbols. Okay. Yeah, you need the and symbols. Have you, like, is there an indication of like executable size or like does it slow down deployments? Is that just not an issue anymore with our current networks? Yeah, so it is bigger. Um, it's going to depend. Like, what, I, the, what the number I don't have for you is what is the ratio between lines of lines of code versus, um, uh, versus what, it, what, what the size is when you include the dwarf. I will find out and I'll let you know. Okay, but I don't have it off the top of my head, but it is, it, it, it's not it's not insignificant because I know some work has been done to to look at dwarf formats and, and look at uh, different ways of doing it. But not only you'll find with, um, when you start introducing tools on the other side of the house, so you get it with, you get it with core, you get it with core dumps with Fatal. If you start including dwarfs, when you start looking at technologies like eBPF and dynamic tracing, um, you will need them for that as well. Okay? okay, so there are a lot of benefits for including it, but yes, you will get some bloat. Okay, so, but there's already tools out there, as you said, like Dynacom for Dynatrace that are already asking for this this flag to go in anyway. So you're not just nothing being changed here. A uh, similar question, like when these dumps happen. Um, how large can they be and like can it have an impact on your production services can you schedule maybe as a feature for these dumps to be executed to be shipped out at low traffic time you know does it have an impact on your production cluster that's a very good question so right now i have a sort of a, a very rudimentary time-based schedule so it writes when you get the core dump you're basically that process is being passed to the operating system okay you want that to just happen as soon as you possibly can and, and get it spat out okay so i try to keep that as lean as i possibly can and then once it's on disk there's a separate process that picks picks up that zip file and pumps it to um 
to the service, right? So even today, you could schedule that process to happen once a day. So the core files remain on the box for, for a day. Um, it isn't, but that would be a time interval based schedule. It wouldn't be a, like a cron schedule. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I like the idea. I'm going to lash that in as an old <laughs> no problem. Like um, the, the zip file that you passed to, was it CLCDI, which was a question I was going to ask, does that have an internal format or can I just pour in whatever I want and the tool will take from it what it can understand? So, you know, like, how does it understand when you dump in your network logs and your TCP logs and your, your environmental logs into .json files? So what it's, it's not, all it's doing at the moment is getting the configuration of that, okay? So it's not getting like a Wireshark dump or, or a network dump of that type, okay? So it, it's just the configure, the Kubernetes configuration for the process for that network. That's what you were seeing inside that JSON file, okay? In terms of, the, there is no specific format for that. All that JSON is, apart from the dump, the, the, the main sort of top level descriptor that's um, all the rest are straight out of uh, CryCTL, out of Cryo. So they're all based on the, um, uh, the container uh, native interface. Okay, so that's that's the representation for that. In terms of if you want to get other information off box, you there's nothing to stop you um, extending the agent. Sorry, extending the composer to um, to put in a few more lines of code and go go query this if you've got some specific scenario and and sort of and go and deploy that yeah, yeah. so the, the more the merrier type of thing for the data that you have on the box so that potentially as you say you're not going to know what you don't need until you, you start debugging type of thing yeah well i just yeah i just wanted to get the information from yeah from kubernetes and like i say it's it's try and keep it as um as relatively extensible as possible. So one thing I was very conscious of is if you want to build your own version of this, and I put the instructions into that project as well, sort of building your own container that can go off and go and do things, you can still use all the other bits that are there. So like, if you want to put more things in the zip file, go and do that. And then you can still use the agent to go and upload it and like the patterns in there for doing that, yeah. Let's go. Um, I, I'm going to go back to you. You said touched off security. I had a couple of questions around that, but I'm going to go to that. You, you said that, and this may be a bit naive, uh, maybe it's a bit late in the evening, but you said that uh, it's like it's aware of the threads. So you're going to get your thread ID, et cetera, that's back there. Can you tell the order of execution? Sorry. Can, can you tell the order of execution? So it will tell you, you using LLDB, and it will give you. Sorry, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask this again just to make sure. I'm like, what do you mean by order of execution? So you have, um, like, we'll say, concurrent threads or parallel processing going on, and yeah. some of them are going to have an effect on each other. Yes. Um, and so I'm wondering, as you debug through it, can you see, oh, that fired first, then that? If there was something where it wasn't too deterministic. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to pull the code file back in. Okay, so you can you can actually start the debugger, and we didn't get into this because I just wanted to show you sort of what the yeah. capabilities were, right? But because you have the image, because you have the core file, you can you can reset, step back, and run it again. And so it's almost like a state machine at that stage that you're yeah, well, walking it, through. You've got a debugger there. Okay. Well, it is a full blown LLDB session. Like, and so, just... as far as it's concerned, it's a single executable that you're walking through. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Okay. So, two, three more questions. Um, are there any, like, I, I, I was only halfway through this, I realized you'd done all this work. Had you thought of any automated tools for, like, as, as you start to gather these, you know, you, there might be recurring things like a, a memory leak, a buffer overflow, or something like that, or just common mistakes people are making, swallowing exceptions type of thing. Tools that could analyze your stack trace and kind of go, hey, you keep doing this. Yep. So that's actually what sparked me to reach out to uh, MeliSearch. So I'm looking at MeliSearch, uh, which is a search engine built in Rust um, to start that initial piece of work. Okay, so what I'm doing right now is I'm just dumping the, uh, getting the stack trace, put, turning that into JSON. And that, sorry, I didn't demo any of this tonight, by the way, this is like a side project that I'm sort of working on on the back of this. So uh, the, yeah, the, my initial thought is let's just get that all that search into, um, sorry, all that content into a search engine, right? And then the papers I'm reading at the moment are actually quite interesting on this. So there's, there's been a lot of work looking at AI 
to analyze the different stack traces and come out with a uh, with some solutions but it turns out that actually a really primitive um uh, if, if you take the top 10 frames from a piece of code strip out the um, strip out the actual location in memory so you just got literally the name of the, the 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 function or the method that failed okay get the top 10 of them you can actually get a really in the in the analysis that's been done kind of on real in real world you get a really good correlation categorization just based on that and they've done it against um like pre-trained and apologies my AI language is going to be dreadful now but they've done it against um uh, or the, the pre pre-trained types neural network and then the sort of the the open types as well where it sort of learns itself and I apologize my, my yeah. world isn't uh, the, okay so the, 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 there is a huge potential for this and then monitoring and graphing the kind of the how, how frequently these things are occurring yes yes yeah, so all that's like, like I say, what I'm thinking of at the moment is dump it all into Melly Search and you'll get all that graphing, et cetera, et cetera, sort of, sort of out of that relatively for free. And then, um, but then the, the real key piece is, is the, cat, the bit that you're after there, which is the categorization. And that's the bit that I think the value is as well. So you want to be able to go, this problem's happened before. It looks like this. Yeah. It can help you debug it and can, but can also um, tell you, give you sort of, yeah, we've got these... You, your organization keeps producing off by one errors or your organization yeah. um, keeps hanging on. Um, or, or it could nearly preempt your mistake once you build your executable, compare it to your past mistakes and see, is it going to work? Yeah. <laughs> you, you wouldn't have the same uh, context, I suppose, before you deploy and run it. Um, it this is fascinating. So two, two or three more questions. Around security was one of the big things I touched on. So you know, the input data is in there, that could be credit cards, it could be SSN numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I, I suppose typically that, that data dies when the memory goes away. So you turn off the, the cluster that, that's gone, but now you're persisting that long-term. And have you got much pushback from the kind of security world about one transferring that? Um, and you know, the secure transport of it, and then the storage of it, the rotation of it, and obfuscation seems like it would be very difficult. So, Obfuscation, obfuscation isn't actually that difficult. Um, so you can implement scrubbers that basically can detect uh, PPI and 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 just and take it out and replace it with a hash. Okay, so that's that's one option. I think in the initial design, what I've gone for is that you, because this isn't as a service, like you you own the S three buckets. You've got an option to the developer doesn't necessarily have um, uh, sorry the 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 software doesn't necessarily require access to that S three bucket. So what I mean is I'm not it's not a cloud service that I'm reaching in and doing okay. stuff with. It's your S three bucket. You can have private network and oh, yeah. and lock down the access to that S three bucket if you want. Like what I demonstrated in terms of uh, sort of a developer flow was. Uh, doesn't necessarily have that lockdown flow, but you can just say, you know, we're just going to take the core dumps and then there's only two people that have access that can actually download that and you can lock it down that way. But I think to be get serious about this, I think you have to scrub it. Yeah, I do. Like if I was going to go and make this like this, is just, like just, but it's, it's a useful, it's a useful tool. But if you were going to go to market with it, I think that's, that's something that you'd, you'd And you mean scrub before the egress, before you send it to S3. So I think you'd scrub it before as you're putting it into S3. So your scrubber would be, um, it could potentially be within the cluster, another process. So it could be in the agent or it, you could have it on, uh, you could do it in flight as you were sending it in. I think the challenge, like you've got to prove that you're not persisting it if you send it up, but at the same time, you've got to, it's a lot easier to provide configuration at that point, you know? So I like, it, yeah, no, 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 you no, probably no, want to do no. both in the end, you know, uh, for certain types that like you don't want to. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose there's a lot of similar paradigms in that. Like what you're really saying is, hey, I'm going to transfer it. It's up to your security, how it gets there and how secure you keep it. That's, you know, the responsibility isn't really your tool after that. And then one final question. The CLI, I, I met a Mr. bit. Is that completely cross-platform? What's that built in? Yeah, so that's Rust as well. That's Rust. Um, yeah, it's the projects. It's in that Codum handler, handler. There's a sub project called Codum Client, 
And there's, if you go to the releases pages for Core Dump Handler, you'll see three, this, it's built for Linux, Mac, and Windows, okay? So it's piping from itself into it, it wrapping around uh, kubectl, the Kubernetes client, okay? So if it's fine for Windows, it's fine on power, it's shell, that's okay. But I've had problems if I'm using like git bash, um, but that's, yeah, there's builds there for that. So yeah, you yeah. get three options. All my questions, that's that's amazing, Anton. I'll definitely be starring you and I'll be recruiting starrers for your uh, repo. Oh, I'll Don't forget to star Anton's repo, people. I need 21 of them at least. <laughs> uh, thanks a million, Anton. If anybody else has any questions there. Yeah. Um, I do see some stuff in chat here. Hold on. Oh, yeah. Can you share the repo in chat? Yep, yeah, Ivan sorted that one out. Nice one. Uh, yeah, is there a lighter weight alternative to Kubernetes, like for small personal home servers? Okay, so I guess Rancher. that would be Docker. <laughs> Rancher. Uh, there is Rancher. No, absolutely. Um, is, there's Dave's is, is kind, is it? Is that, is that their one? Uh, 3KS, I can't remember which one it is. But yeah, there is. Um, uh, on our side of the house, on the IBM side of the house, we've just released OpenShift single node as well, which is, again, like single node deployment of, uh, there we go, K3D, K3AS, yeah, yeah, cheers. So yeah, there's 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 lots of options um, uh, to them, depends on, kind of depends on what you want to do. So um, yeah, so locally, like I use Docker, I use Docker locally, but I'm also, st I'm really starting to get into Podman um, and not just because of, the controversy that happened earlier around sort of the different uh, uh, financial models that Docker's decided to dream up this year, like Podman gives you the the this basis or this idea of actually being able to create containers, uh, multiple containers, and put them into a pod. It feels a lot more like Kubernetes than Docker does. So you can you can compose the different services within the same release within, within the same pod and that thing will be the same thing that's deployed into kubernetes as well so it took me a while to get my head around podman because it just felt like this is just docker but it sort of with with red hat fanciness in to be to be perfectly honest with you but no there's it, it's more it's better aligned to kubernetes um when you get into the internals and it's 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 quite nice that way. So that might be another option. So the Docker, Podman, and then the myriad of lightweight Kubernetes. Like I said, there's single uh, uh, single node OpenShift now, and there's the stuff the KD, K3D, K3S, Kind, whatever, whatever's going on. Cool. Okay, you got one star there already. That's excellent. Have I? More <laughs> refresh, refresh another day off. <laughs> day off. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't send me back to the sales. Don't send me back to the sales. Right. Yeah. Uh thanks. Thanks for all the questions, Al. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. That was fascinating. Fascinating. Um I think Dimas has a question here. Oh, sorry, I, just unmute yourself and fire questions there if anybody doesn't need to raise hands politely anymore. No, I'm just uh, using the re clap reaction. I can see sorry, that, that emoji interpretation out of me. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so looks like that's it for this week. Thanks everybody for coming along. Um, hopefully we'll have another fascinating hour next, um, next month to schedule this again and talks of an in-person eventually when lockdown and all of this is over somewhere in Dublin, hopefully. Yeah, actually just on that, while well, everyone's here, I think we've got loads of folks from all over Europe. So I think we'll try and all over the world, actually, never mind just Europe. I know, I know folks uh, dive in from South America and, and, and further afield even. Like we will try and keep them, like have a broadcast piece to it as well. Um, so folks can still sort of dial in uh, and watch us have pints. But um, drink, drink. I'm, I'm, I, I think we should try and keep that going if we do meet up. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I yeah, know it's a great idea, Anthony. Yeah, we'll definitely make sure that there's AV for, for any of these. Keep it all online. Yeah. yeah. And, th and thanks to Ertigal for, for going through the tonic and the GRPC stuff. Like, I keep promising myself it. to look at that. And it's just, I'm glad he went through the pain there, you know? Yeah. Fair play to him. Okay, folks. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I am going to go for a pint and I will talk to you all soon. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.